firecracker, huh? That's a new one. I've been called a lot of things, and even late for dinner. Um, it's my pleasure today to examine a, an, uh, a challenge that hopefully everyone in the room will confess that they have. Now, we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. No Mentimeter, no other electronic polls. How many of you are having challenges moving the dial on your shared services operations? Come on, don't be shy. A few honest people here. <laughs> Very few. How many of you have found that changing the relationship with the business is a real challenge? Okay. How many of you have found that as much as we want to automate the bejesus out of everything, it's almost impossible to do because the business wants the personal touch? Okay. How many of you are just tired of dealing with one more percentage point in cost savings when you really want to focus on revenue, working capital, and a better customer experience? Okay. Well, hopefully today, you'll learn the tricks of the trade. Let's talk about um, why it's so difficult to move the dial on shared services operations. I have a theory, and for those of you who follow me, you know I have lots of theories, some of which are founded and some of them are absolutely crazy. But I've been watching this industry for some time, and one of the things I've realized is the shared services model is designed to deliver no. Think about this for a minute. Shared services is about no. You think I'm crazy? No. no. <laughs> and that's why I have no on the back. All right. Let's talk about what the model really is about. It's about no uncertainty. You know, it's better be the same thing day after day after day. It's about no customization. After all, standardization is the lingua franca of shared services. It's about no differentiated talent. You've got to hire the same guy or gal you hired the year before. It's about no radical change. After all, the business is undergoing radical change. You are the silent runners of the enterprise. No disruption. You start to disrupt the business and move faster than they can move, and all hell will break loose. No noise. We all know that noise is not a good thing for shared services. No friction, it's got to be seamless. Uh, no red on the dashboard, you do that at your own peril. No mandate, because your CXOs, as much as they endorse you, when the business comes to them and says, we don't like those shared services folks, what do they do? Do they cave? And last but not least, no investment. Do more with less and less and less. So, it's a no model. You buy that? <laughs> okay, you heard it here. All right. But the challenge is that the business context has changed. We don't think about decades of change now. We think about months of change. We have higher productivity expectations. We have a differentiated uh, uh, um, challenge when it comes to talent. Technology is changing so fast that every month uh, Apple seems to come out with a new iPhone. Uh, focus on experience. We want people to really feel good about what they do. Uh, we've got work generations who just don't think the same way that some of you do, and they certainly don't think the same way I do. Um, we've got beliefs about the workplace, and when we go to work and when we don't go to work that have shifted. And um, business cycles which just churn and churn and churn and churn and churn. So the business, pressure, business context is putting extreme pressure on the fact that we're a no model. So how do we change shared services value from yes to no? What we're going to do today is take four different opinions, hopefully they don't agree with each other, from their own experience, talk about how they've gotten to yes. And it's my pleasure to first introduce Richard Cornish. Richard is the king of the MODs, of British MODs <laughs> operations. Uh, he's a highly secretive man, and we're going to try to winkle out some of his trade secrets today. Welcome, Richard. Next to him is Suzanne Dreyer. 
Suzanne is um, about one third of everyone in Shell is part of Shell business operations. Uh, Shell arguably has been at a certain type of model for longer than anyone else. And uh, Suzanne has particular challenges and opportunities when it comes to moving the dial. Welcome, Suzanne. Next to her is Dilip Kumar. Dilip is the CDO and all things important at NTT. He's had um, the opportunity to take out a clean sheet of paper and design a GBS from scratch. Is he a lucky dude or not? <laughs> yeah. And last but not least, and I'm going to say it right because I practiced all last night, is Prarag, not prerogative, Sagankar, <laughs> who has the pain and the privilege of leading Deloitte's GBS operations. And he's going to help me keep these folks honest uh, through some of his own operations. So, without further ado, are you ready, panel? Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Cracker Jack. All right. We're going to go back and talk about... No, it didn't get move. Let's see. All right. No, no notes. First of all, a question for you. Uh, in your opinion, is moving the dial incremental or can it be radical? Who wants to go first? Incremental. And why? Because uh, we don't want to break it. You don't want to break it. All right. Suzanne. I would say it depends. I think in general it's incremental because you need to build the trust and you need to really earn your seat at the table. It's a journey and it takes time. But I think what we saw as well, if you take external factors like COVID or if you take a burning platform sense of urgency, things can go really fast. For me, or for us as a company, it is radical. Absolutely radical. Three years ago, we just got 31 companies together. We had to integrate 31 companies. It was not about one more percentage more. It was not about removing the bumps. It was not about just getting one business operations up and running. It was about realizing the full potential of the company. And absolutely, why is it radical for us? Because we as a company pulled on two levers. One was to get fit, and the other one was to drive profitable growth, both at the same time. Therefore, I would say, at NTT, the entire GBS journey has been extremely radical and it's changed the company big time in the last three years. Park that thought. And Parag, what do you see in your clients? Do so you I think incremental uh, or radical? So I think you kind of go incremental and wait for those hockey stick moments. That's my Canadian roots well, coming out. you're Canadian. You've got to talk about <laughs> and, hockey. And for the right. radical moments, because any innovation has always had radical moments in its journey. All right. So we've got a kind of a mixed bag here. So if we're not going to destroy, other than perhaps Dilip, destroying to create, what are some of the levers you can pull? The first one we'd like to talk about is organization. Now, I happen to believe that who you are becomes what you are. And all of you, and Parag as, as a voyeur in this industry, have seen folks work with organizations to change the way shared services creates value for the enterprise. So let's talk a little bit about uh, organization. What have you all done in your organizations? What, how have you tweaked to be able to change the way uh, shared services creates value. Don't all pile on, please. Okay, so let, let me start on this. As we're bringing the 31 companies together, we had to find a playbook for ourselves. And if you really see most of us, we start with the first thing, how do I remove the barriers? Second, how do I make sure that the entire company is aligned on the strategy? Two, remove the silos. Silos kills the entire transformation. And third is how to measure the success. So what did we do at NTT? We had a new CEO, 21, 2021. It was during COVID. So CEO is the chief architect of the transformation. Change number one. Okay. It's not been relegated down. CEO is the chief architect. So you had a mandate at the top to change Correct. the way it worked. 
-hmm. Let's talk about silos for a minute because I think the two of you also have dealt with these very strong silos, especially functional silos in your organizations. And how have you changed them? Because mm -hmm. our predilection is to go to silos. So I think if I share about Shell, we have about 28,000 people in our Shell business operations, 20 different businesses, and we have matured a lot over the recent years. So we really made a shift from um, transactional roles to more strategic roles. And I think from the silo point of view, we also look at the end-to-end -end processes integrated. We look at it from a customer perspective, from an employee perspective, and through that review, you could really start taking out silos and layers to really make it more efficient. The other thing we are doing I wanted to share is we expand our talent pool. So we really want to be one of the most diverse and inclusive companies in the world. And to do that is we need to be in shell reflective of the society we work in. So what we want to do is employ a lot more people with disabilities. If you think about one of the six people have a disability or will get one over the lifetime. 80% of these people are unemployed. So it's a huge opportunity for us to tap into this market. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really progressing really hard across Shell, including the Shell business operations. And I think the thing we did, um, yeah, I never start off with organization change as the solution, but I think for us it really was important. You know, the functions were very siloed uh, and our organization was very siloed. So we really worked hard um, at trying to fuse the functions together. Um, it is a journey, you know, it's not something that you're going to change overnight and it will incrementally uh, adapt over the next few years. But I think for me, that's been important, but also at the same time, it's as much about changing mindsets as it is about changing all charts. And that's the thing we keep having to work out. Now, when you blow up silos, you change reporting lines, Parag. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You have to look at uh, reporting lines, you look at career journeys, give people opportunities to work as part of the broader enterprise. Very tactically, we also changed titles to match what the overall enterprise was. When I was running our own uh, GBS organization, and just to have that level of consistency, a manager is a manager is a manager, regardless of where you're working. And increasingly, we're looking at branding as well, and just to have it, well, I, I've seen organizations move away from the whole extended business services or some sort of a, a separate appendage to the enterprise and just make it, you know, in your yeah. case, that'll be like, Shell Bangalore or, you know, Shell mm -hmm. in the location. So that made a huge difference in, in, in people's mindset that they're actually working for one enterprise. And no. I think the employee value proposition, you know that you have one employee proposition for everyone in the company. There is no difference if you work offshore, onshore, it doesn't matter. And making clear what is your purpose. I think the why piece was really important for us, that every individual <coughs> employee understands how they contribute to the bigger picture of what we try to achieve in the company. Now, one of the challenges, again, is that shared services is about no. And so we tend to go to command and control organization structures. What have you done to get rid of all this, hmm, did you, did you check in at a certain time sort of mentality? What have you done? Yeah, but again, it goes back to what you spoke about, breaking the silos. You see, if you really look at it, if we have to get the, unlock the value and really land the outcomes, there are three functions that have to come together. So function one is the technology piece, two is the GBS, and three is the market. So what have we done? We've got all the three under one digital office and GBS organization, making sure that there is no friction between these different silos. So you've gone three in a box, really? Correct. We put the three in the box. Now, one of the things, Parag, you and I talked about is the fact that titles get in the way. You know, VPs report to SVPs, who report to EVPs, and so on and so forth. What have you seen as a lever by changing the titles? You know, I think people, I was naive. Like, when I walked into our organization. That was when you were younger, right? A bit younger, yeah, yeah a few years back. As young as you, I think, at that time. <laughs> So we had, I was told in GBS organizations that for retaining talent, people had to get promoted every two years because they have to go and tell, tell family. Mommy. And, and there's, a, there's almost an internal pressure for promotions. So we, ended, we had 14 titles in our GBS organization at that time, whereas in the broader enterprise, there were five. Huge change management, by the way, radical, not incremental because we had to figure out a way to say that you're just part of that enterprise. 
So all of a sudden you go from an exotic associate vice president title to becoming a manager. Big psychological change, but then you know, it's something that needed to be done if you really want to feel part of that organization. So I think titles matter. They may not matter in some of the Western geographies as much, but I think in many of the locations... Oh, it matters where, in the West. No, too. I'm sure it does as well. So. But yeah, I mean, the titles definitely matter. Now, have any of you put in new types of roles in your organization? I know, Suzanne, you're holding out on us. You want me to go first? Oh, the, you, you have people from the hospitality yes, industry. Yes, so I think one example... You never thought shared services was hospitable. <laughs> so we have hired experience managers in our centers to really make sure we, we treat our employees as guests when they come in and that they really get the employee experience they deserve. So they look after community building, they make sure the workplace experience works really well, they test new apps, they are having a lot of different engagements and I think we want to treat our employees. I mean, they're the most important asset we have, so we need to make sure they are looked after as well. Okay, so let's follow on because, you know, there's an old saw, fish stink from the head. So let's talk about leadership, okay? Um, you're a non-GBS native, Dilip. You didn't know how to spell GBS. Correct. You didn't know what it meant Correct. until Correct. not too long Correct. ago. What's your view about the, uh, uh, the leadership, um, uh, how, how leadership changes Fantastic. the organization. Fantastic. Look, exactly as you said, 25 years in the business. Here's a new boss says, look, I want somebody from business to drive GBS and digital office. Why? I think we all have to take one step back and say, every business initiative is a GBS initiative. What does it mean? You need people in GBS who understands business. You just can't be operations. So what did we do? We absolutely had the best team from GBS. We collected a good team from GBS, from digital. But we appointed a GBS leader who was our CFO, who understands finance in and out, but with a lot of technology behind him. So he was voluntold to take this on? Uh, voluntarily appointed. Okay, <laughs> we'll buy that. To take on that role. All so right. number one, me, myself, coming into the role from business to run the entire transformation. Two, the GBS leader from finance now runs the GBS. And then, of course, with a lot of good other people. But the new roles that you asked, that's a very important question. Most of us try and put people around technology, delivery, operations. What we really miss is the two most important roles, adoption and consumption. And I'll talk about it a little later on. But really, the new roles that are required to drive success in a GBS is not just keep the back end. You have to connect to the front end. And the front end is enabling that adoption, helping them to find the new ways of doing things, and therefore, the new outcomes. So the leadership has to speak the same language. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, a, you're not a GBS native. No, no. So I, my career is largely in operational delivery, which is the largest profession in the UK civil service, but all about um, delivery. So I pull upon a lot of that. Uh, anchor for me, but also across our workforce. So we want functional experts, but we also want operational delivery experts. And, and I think it is that uh, hybrid of lots of different skills that are really bringing different yeah. things to the team. And I think the, uh, on a slightly different tack, one of the things that uh, I really, really value, even though I'm not a sort of a separate sort of legal organization, I'm very much part of defense, we really pull upon a team of non-executive directors because they bring in advice from largely from industry that really gives us a good support. So you really, well. in your leadership, you actually take an outside-in approach Absolutely to well. GPS. Yeah, so it's all about a mix, I think. Yeah, just coming on, we've talked a lot about company values, company brand, connecting to the business. I want to focus back to your question, right? What's your personal brand as a GBS leader? We work with an organization. They were starting a healthcare client, setting up a captive in, in, in India. We actually built up a, a social media plan for that individual. Because fundamentally, people want to work for people. Mm. You can build in the company culture, and that's required as well. But they want to go work. I want to go work for Richard. I want to go work for Suzanne. I want to work for Dilip. And it's hugely important for people in these organizations to say, hey, that's the person that I want to emulate. So I think organizations need to spend a bit more as well on their individual brand. And there's so many different social media platforms to sort of ensure you kind of actively drive that. And I think, I think that's right. I think that's the right. other thing that we find in defense is that 
we were sometimes seen as quite separate. So whilst also trying to build up the sort of the brand, as it were, separate we're also trying to, well, separate mm, uh, but also we then need to try and make sure we feel very much part of that organisation so that we are providing things in defence for defence rather than sort of slightly adjacent to defence, if you see what I mean. And I would add as well that you really want integrative leaders. You want people who can think strategically, who can be transformational, but who are also outcome driven and can really engage with their teams. And now we work differently than in the past. You have global teams, you have many cultural sensitivities you need to be aware of. You want people leading with empathy as well. So I think there's a whole change coming as well in terms of the leadership you're looking at. Which is a perfect segue into the big C word, capability. Uh, we don't need the same capabilities we needed even three, four years ago. We are dealing with AI. We need, we need certainly uh, advanced technological capabilities. We're global. We need people who understand, as you say, how to work uh, globally. Um, we may not need outsourcing contract managers anymore, but people who really understand work placement at its core. In your experience, what capabilities do you need in your organizations to be able to move the dial? So, so again, capabilities, I think we, we know the framework now. There's a GBS model 1.0 and there's a 2.0. It's come out of evolving. And those capabilities now in the 2.0 or the new world is all around experience, productivity, relevance, and of course, driving growth. So if you take a step back and say, look, what are the capabilities required to drive those? So in terms of productivity and experience, do we have one single cross-enterprise platform that can drive productivity and experience? What we have done is exactly put a three-layer approach. Although we have 39 different ERPs, we bonded that with a single digital layer and an experience layer. Similarly, relevance. It's extremely important that we move away from silos, which technically means you have to do an end-to-end. -end. And if you have to do end-to-end, the question is, what are the technologies that will bind it to earth end-to-end? But to what end? are the people capabilities, Dilip? So, so there are two parts to it. One is the technology capabilities, two is the digital capabilities with the people. It's extremely important that from operations, that means the domain knowledge is number one, and that domain knowledge applied back to the pieces of technology. Let's say an AR automation, an AP automation, a period-end automation, a whole case management. There's so much happening right now. So I think the blend of technology with operations is the capabilities that we're looking for, and it may not be there in every one. So what we do is we have a collection of people or team of teams, it's called the pod teams. So we create a pod team that will absolutely share the experience among all the people. Yeah, I mean, essentially, I think the GVS has, leader has to provide a sandbox for innovation. Right now, it's all about AI and gen AI. Two, three years from now, it'll be about something else and all of it is going to be requiring talent. Now, is that new innovative idea going to come from London or New York or Shanghai or Bangalore? We don't know. But if you have 30% of the organization, essentially the full organization there, if you can create a sandbox for building out these capabilities, Candace talked about our center office model and capabilities as our, our service. That's the one big area that GBS organizations are focusing on. So, the three or four capabilities I can list now will be very different from the three or four capabilities yeah. two, three years from now. And I think that's the key. If we look at it, we say the ability to apply a learner mindset is really, really important because yeah. we don't know how the future organization will look like in detail. We don't know all the future skills. So we think if we have people who are lifelong learners, they will be also resilient to change and they can have then career developments as well. And we saw last year, 30% of our people made a career move, 20% had a promotion, 10% moved within different, company, within different businesses in Shell. I mean, this is fascinating. You know, you have a career. You don't have to leave the company. How yeah. do you find a lifelong learner, though? That's a good point. How do, you, how do you test for that? How do you know if someone's a lifelong learner? I think you need to find it out. I think it's, yeah, talking about it. It's about letting people share their experience and also be vulnerable, you know, to say, look, we try this, it didn't work, let's try it in a different way, experimenting. And I think it's also leading from the top that also senior leaders make mistakes and that we all need to apply this learner mindset. I mean, it's a fundamental core value of what we want in Shell. I think it's really important as well to have really clear career paths in shared services. I think so, so much of the time people go away from shared services to develop their career and we need to see more 
uh, clear supported path for people. But equally, I think back to one of the points earlier on diversity, we need to think differently about where, how, and who we recruit. Uh, and we've just been, for example, for the first time ever gone out to shopping malls, uh, doing jobs fairs in the last couple of weekends, which we've never done something like that shopping before. Malls. Yeah, and really? we've tried doing that to really sort of reach a very different... And what kind of new capabilities have you found? So, so we'll be doing apprenticeships, uh, okay. starting people at entry level on digital roles rather than just trying to hire people further up. And we just need to sort of think about different approaches. So being able to figure out what the best brand of mascara is is not good for the MOD? <laughs> Not necessarily, okay. no, no. But good general skills are oh, always welcome. Good general skills. What <laughs> but, about... But, but, go ahead, please. I was just going to say, you know, curiosity. I mean, risk-taking. I mean, these are the types of things, to your earlier slide, if everything's about standardization, and here's your profile, and here's you got to fit, who's testing out, hey, what's the biggest risk you've taken? And it's kind of contrary to the whole point, right, which is all compliance and standardization. But... The, or, the locations where our centers are being set up in Central Europe and Latin America and in, in, in Asia, there's full of people that just want to be innovators. They want to try out different things, and you can test that. You can test out some elements of, you know, curiosity and risk taking. What about the relationship uh, capabilities going back and forth from the business to the business of shared services? What have you done to look at a little bit more osmosis? I mean, I think we, I've deliberately been hiring people from different parts of the wider organisation and supporting people that want to make the, the opposite move as well, because I think otherwise we do become too disconnected from the wider organisation. So I think that's, that's really important and been a key thing we've been doing. We spend a lot of time as well doing business partnering, really training people at different levels in the organisation across different functions and businesses on what does it mean to be a business partner, what are the different roles you can play, and really getting feedback as well, you know, being open about it and say how I am doing, what else do I need to do? I am really a transformer, I am just the post box, what is the role I'm playing? And letting people understand how they contribute to the business outcomes, I think that's really important, so they know how to be problem solvers. And one of the things you do is you enforce rotations in Correct. your organization. Correct, so we're really strong on the learning culture whereby you see lots of movements and we encourage people to move after a couple of years. And Dilip, I know you're very keen on promoting an employee value proposition. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's again, we, we, have, we, we just can't have multiple teams, as I keep telling my theory. The silos has to get broken. So what we make sure that every employee that comes into the place, he sees the best. So we have a total employee proposition, both for GBS and for the retained organization, one single. But to your point, it's all about driving the success and driving the outcomes. There's always a friction, there's always a dissatisfaction when you start with something new. Mm -hmm. The real question is, how do you bring it closer to the business? And we have to know that GBS and technology in a traditional organization is seen as an island. They're just not connected to the mainland of business. So you need lots of translators to connect it back to the mainland. And this is where we have deliberately added adoption specialists who will drive the change between what is happening at the back end and into the front end. Yeah. Now, let's, talk a, let's pivot a little bit and talk about business alignment. I mean, one of the challenges we have with shared services models is that they're often, and I, I say this with, with all honesty, they're seen as the doormat of the organization. And changing business alignment means that you can start to change the value that not only you deliver, but also that you're perceived to deliver. So what have you all done or seen in your case, Parag, about changing the alignment with the business? And I'm going to ask Sus Suzanne to start because her model is different from many yes. models. And maybe let me just quickly explain our model. So we have the landlord model, but we like to call it the common infrastructure management model meaning that myself and my team, we are responsible for the whole community building, for portfolio changes and decisions, strategic choices, recruitment of talent, the infrastructure we have, road transportation, uh, learning and development, etc. So all of the infrastructure piece we manage for the organization. And what we do is we run a really tight governance, meaning that I meet with my business partners on a regular basis, but we also come together on a 
Business Operations Council, how we call it, so that's the senior people where we talk about strategic choices, where we really align what's happening in terms of future of work, in terms of closing a location, opening a location, attrition challenges, etc. And then we also meet a level down on the Business Operations Forum to make sure we have the full alignment across everything what we're doing in Shell. And it takes a lot of business partnering, but I think it works, and therefore you get more alignment from a business-to-business -business perspective as well. And the other thing we did, I'm really proud of, we are not there yet, but we started, is harmonizing what we pay, so in terms of remuneration for our staff. It's incredible. Yeah, it's a, it's a long shot, and we started, and we have all the agreements in place, it will take years, but it really takes away the second-class citizenship. So if you do a role in country where you have a GBS organization and a non-GBS, if people do similar jobs with a similar job grade, they will get the same... Uh, benefits and the same pay, and that's a huge step forward, in my belief. Richard, you've uh, done something which uh, was a little alien to the MOD relative to who owns the customer. Well, yeah, and I think one of the things we've really thought differently about is rather than having a lot of those individual functional kind of siloed views of our services, we've started to introduce a, sort of the horizontal enterprise customer board. So we're talking to all of our customers, our kind of corporate customers in one go, in one meeting to really start driving that cross enterprise conversation. Uh, and I think that like, it's early days and it's going to take a while. I think we're quite far behind where you've got to, but I think it's really important to do that and to hold your nerve and to start developing. And, and one other quick point, I think going back to, to what we said a bit earlier, I think we've sometimes been in the trap of, as the shared services organization, thinking we're developing our strategy for the wider enterprise. And I think we've, I've been trying to change the mindset. So we're really focused on this is the organization's strategy, not my strategy for someone else, uh, and, and just thinking differently. So with reducing that the barriers. Yeah. Now, you, sir, have put up, you believe in, in, in not necessarily aligning with the business to create something called tension. See, let, let me come back on the business side. This is a very important one. I think Prague touched upon the brand. What's the brand of a GBS? You can have one or two different ways of representing it. One, you can say the GBS guy is responsible for savings, cost, efficiency, quality, make the transaction work day in and day out. Fine, that's one part of it. But the way I see my GBS head, and I'll talk about GBS and CEO myself, GBS is my chief simplification officer. Not a cost savings guy, not just driving quality transaction, not just a doormat just to take all the shit on that. No. He's our chief simplification officer. So day in and day out, my GBS guy is sitting, GBS team along with the GBS leader is sitting and saying, what is the as is process? What is the to be process? What can be automated? What can be taken out? And that's exactly the journey that we are on for the last three years. Now coming to me as CDO, again, what is that rattles me every day? Is it just these project and completion? I just raise the level and say, as CDO, I am the chief dissatisfaction officer. <laughs> I'm not happy with status quo. Just not happy. If my DSO today is 70, why not 50? If my DPO is 84, why not 60? Or if my turnaround time on a quote is, let's say, 44 days, why not four hours? What should we be doing? And that's how we can keep raising the bar because this is where the role of GBS is much different in the current era, which is driving business value, which is driving outcomes, and therefore, that constant dissatisfaction keeps raising the bar, and we raise the relevance also back to the business on end-to-end. -end. But, but that's dissatisfaction that's... within your organization. What about dissatisfaction with the customer? No, no. When I say dissatisfaction, remember I told you the one key word, is many of the back office functions do not know the heartbeat of the front office. I run the front office as well. So I know exactly what is required by the client in terms of quote and in terms of turnaround time and so on and so forth. So I become the translator back again, saying, no, 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 what you're doing is not good. Raise the level. Raise the level of this. Raise so the level of this. you tell them that sh they should be unhappy. Correct. Okay. That's a new one. I, I mean, so, I, can I just, if I can just come in here, I mean, I think that um, that makes sense, and as long as you're building another 50 Dilips below you who also have that connect to the enterprise heartbeat, 
Um, That's a Cadley point. Yeah, and, and, point. and otherwise this whole idea, oh, the GBS person's building their kingdoms, yes, right? Exactly. Right, that comes up all the time. But I think that's when you take the landlord model or the common infrastructure model, what we have, the businesses who are making use of our shell business operations, they own the end-to-end -end processes, they own the operational excellence, they own dealing with the customers, so everything stays intact in its one line which goes really well from what we see, and that's why we see maybe the penetration levels and the customer sat satisfaction scores, which are really, really positive. And you need to be really open with the challenges that you've got. There's no good yeah. having a you know, beautiful set of watermelon KPIs, nice and green on the outside, really red on the inside. You need to kind of open up what's going on in the organization so that you can kind of share those challenges and get to work on some of that end-to-end -end stuff together. Yeah. So How do you I like, build I like the coalition? I guess that's, I'm sorry. I like the watermelon KPI. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's my mine originally, but I nicked it from someone. But Can it's I a good one. One last piece is is the whole idea of driving simplification. You know, I'm just going to compliment Suzanne. I mean, if you go down to Bangalore and you see the shell organization, it's actually multiple organizations within Bangalore. They actually have a mini shell in Bangalore. They got refining. They got renewables. Mm. They've got a little shell store there that you can actually, it's like a little convenience store. And then plus they have all their business operations. If you're GBS people, and which I'd like to challenge people, how many of your, business, your people actually know what your business does? What are those value drivers for your business? Not GBS. I think they've figured those out. What does your organization do in the real world? So is your uh, team uh, going up with fighter pilots? <laughs> well, I've got some military that are actually in my team as well, so it's not completely civilians. But that's really powerful because uh, for a very small element of my workforce, I actually have serving military folk that understand the end user experience themselves for those services. So again, back to what we said earlier, it's that mix of different skills, that mix of different expertise and experience. But it's also being able to visit maybe assets and see what's happening or yeah. bringing the people in and working in natural teams. I think there's so much opportunity by breaking the silos and work together based on the outcome you need to deliver as a team. So you, all of you have been focusing on understanding the customer journey, yeah. not yeah. telling them, but actually listening to them. Okay. And how has that moved the dial? The fa what can you tell me that's been tangible by putting yourself in the shoes of the customer, as all of you have and you, your clients have as well, Parag. Well, how has it changed? Has it taken down the friction? What's, what's been the outcome? I think it's daunting, because actually, sometimes it exposes you to things you didn't know, and therefore the task is slightly bigger than you thought it was going to be, uh -huh. because you start pulling away at things, and then you go, well, actually, that process isn't very good, is it? And that is having this impact on the next thing. So it's, it's slightly daunting, um, probably at worst, but you've got to go through that to start pulling it through to improve it. Yeah, well, building on that, it's, you might need to change what you're doing and how you do it, because you realize what you designed didn't work. So, I mean, we did many things in terms of how you onboard people, and that's maybe more internal. But it was not doing what we needed to do, so we need to change. Or think about the customer operations that really look from a global customer experience perspective, working together on OTC with all the different parties involved to see how can we make it easier for the clients or the customers. How do we have one voice to the customer? Having everyone access to the same data at the same point. Well, this... This session's going very, very fast, so I'm going to f ask one question. If those of you who know Peter Muller know that he's been having this rant about lights out finance for years. I don't know where you are, Peter, but you, uh, you've been uh, in the vanguard, and yet we're still not at lights out finance. So the question I would ask you all is, how have you used technology to move the dial, or are we still playing with it? Are we still talking about bots and not really implementing? How have, you, how have you harnessed the power of technology to change the way shared services delivers value in your organizations? So, I mean, I think for us, it's back to incremental. So we've got some really big ticket ERP reform, move to cloud, everything that everyone else is doing. But what we've had to do in the meantime is really exploit automation to try and digitalize some of the really clunky processes we have that aren't even perhaps going through an ERP. So that's been the sort of fairly tactical way, but actually for users, it's pretty transformative. So that's been where we've focused a lot of the energy in the short term. Yeah, I think we used automation in lots of cases in all the different businesses we have, and digitalization is key. I think if you look at generative AI, that's a big transformational shift as well for us. I think we need to manage the hype, you know, where, where are the use cases for us? But I think the key piece is it will not replace the humans in the GBS. I think it will be an additional tool people can use. 
and the people who are able to use generative AI, they will be outperform other people and you will be more competitive. So I think how you give them the skills so that they can work with the tools we have and the developments to make even more impact. So you don't subscribe to the sentiment of some that GBS is dead? No, I don't think so. I think it will flourish even more. So, so, so for me, uh, for us as a team, it is three steps. First is digitization, massive amounts of digitization at the back end. Once it is digitized, then we've gone into automation now, automation of AR, automation of AP, automation of code, automation of period and closing, automation of everything. And then towards the end, it's all about experience, user and client experience, completely making sure that it's visible to them. So we've gone through multiple steps here, but absolutely it is filled with automation, digitization and experience from year two onwards. I think the vision, and I've shared it with a couple of people, is, you know, it's NASA command control. I mean, the GBS organization has, it's the heart of the business. They've got information on all parts of the business. You saw the long list from the speakers in this morning. If you had all those functions and your data across that enterprise, where else in your enterprise do you have that cross-section of information? So you're, whether you're expanding into another market, there's an M&A transaction you're trying to integrate, if you can see that, I mean, the Maersk uh, gentleman was earlier on stage as well. I mean, you think about an industry over the last three, four years has dramatically been impacted and everybody's eyes are on that industry. Imagine if you had the Maersk, you know, kind of shared services and that's the dashboard. Yeah. Well, we have time for one more provocation. Um, often customers' experience is, not, is more important than what you're actually delivering. It's how they feel about what you're doing rather than what you're actually doing. Uh, what are the one things you all have seen or, or done to uh, break the status quo by changing the customer experience? I think working with a customer, not designing something in isolation and think we know it better, but really going back and forth with the customer, engaging, testing things, and then developing together. So what we have done is, um, if I just take the opportunity to order, we've actually put a tool or a process or a system that can go direct. You really don't need an agent in between. So we have saying, look, a certain percentage of quotes and orders should be direct. Similarly, dispute management, certain percentage we want to be direct. So we, that's the way we are trying to make sure that even the clients start seeing the benefits of transformation that we're driving within the company. So they're still feeling they're in control because Correct. the middleman is not is middle. Correct. Correct. What about you, customer experience? So I think sometimes we get slightly obsessed about the tech. So although the tech is often a solution and can be a really critical solution, we need to really understand the business problem first. And I think sometimes we start with the tech and work way, our way backwards. So from a sort of customer point of view of trying to get to the heart of the problem, start there and then work out the solutions. Yeah, we um, did a bit of a study again when I was running our own organization is the biggest linkage to customer dissatisfaction actually ended up being communication skills. Mm -hmm. so, Telling a story. Yeah, so that was the, the whole idea around, we set up what we called a communication gym mm -hmm. to actually get, tell people, it's not really about teaching them English skills or, or language skills, it was much, much more than that. It's empathetic listening. How do you engage with, with, with businesses? How do you tell your story? Business theatrics. There's a lot of different tools and techniques that we don't really look upon as really being adding value. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, you know, as you started the conversation and this question is, people will remember how you felt. Right. Yes. I mean, projects will go off charts, off, you know, timelines. But if you can get onto that Friday evening projects and uh, call, status call, and say, hey, here's what's happened, and here's how we're going to address it, your customers are going to be fine. Yeah. Well, no panel is complete without a piece of advice or uh, what you're going to do tomorrow. So I'm going to start with you, Richard. If you could do one thing, one thing was in your gift to break the status quo at the MOD, what would that be? So I think it would be to hold our nerve. If you've, hold got, your nerve, huh? if you've got a good long-term plan, it's going to take time, uh, and you won't always get quick wins overnight. Suzanne? For me, being a curious business partner. Nosy too? Noisy. And nosy. Nosy, but also making sure you apply the learner mindset we talked about and being yeah, challenging and having the conversation, not shying away for the difficult conversations. See, for me, I think we've already started this in the last six months. We are adding more and more success managers 
to make sure that whatever we are doing in the GBS is going back to the business, driving the adoption, driving the consumption. So we do have success managers now for each of our markets, for each of our regions, and sometimes even each of the end-to-end -end process as well. Um, last word. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to come back to the personal brand. If each one of us GBS leaders in the audience could really revisit how do your people perceive you? What's your personal brand? What do you bring to the table? Because at the end of the day, they want to work for you. They don't want to work for only a logo. So I think that connection really matters. And lead everyone into the breach. Something well, like you that. have it here. Please join me in uh, thanking uh, my illustrious panel and telling you how to turn from no to yes. Thank you very much. <laughs>